Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my privilege and honor to moderate this uh, plaque talk, Made in Africa, uh, which will be launching a series of uh, reflections, debates, and discussions on the major transitions of the African continent, capitalizing on Africa's assets, but also assessing new priorities and needs and proposing alternatives as the world, not just the African continent, is rethinking its new business models and also new uh, development models as we are facing the difficult consequences of the impact of coronavirus uh, pandemic. Major political and socioeconomic transitions have taken or must and will be taken uh, part um, uh, on the African continent, which definitely requires inclusive policies, stakeholder engagement, but more specifically, new leadership. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce a panel of honorable speakers who have extensive experience, whether at government or at business and civil society, who will be sharing with us insights, but also challenges on how we're going to overcome these uh, uh, transitions, uh, more specifically post coronavirus uh, uh, crisis. The world is also shifting to new markets and new jobs and new markets are emerging uh, because of the rapid increase of the digital transformation, but also the inter, uh, artificial intelligence. So let me uh, start first by introducing uh, dist our distinguished uh, panel of speakers. Uh, Mrs. Grace Njapo, I hope, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Njapo, right? No, it's Njapao. Njapao, okay. Uh, thank Good. you for correct me, uh, correcting me. So, ma'am, uh, 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 you are from Zambia and you are an accomplished entrepreneur who served as a member of Zambia Parliament from 2006 to 2009. Uh, you are a prominent national, uh, you, you hold national leadership positions, including Deputy Minister of Home Affairs and led significant initiatives to the betterment of your country. Welcome, uh, ma'am, with us, but also you are an accomplished businesswoman holding notable high-level positions such as National Coordinator of Zambia Morocco Friendship Association and also member of Zambia Federation of Women in Business and many more. Welcome, ma'am, with us. We are happy to have you uh, among us today. I have also the privilege to introduce Dr. Edal Rabate from Niger and uh, Dr. Adal Rabate, his minister advisor to the president of the Republic of Niger and president of the party Mouvement Démocratique pour le Renouveau. And also he's an accomplished doctor who is very close to communities in Niger and he has accomplished a lot, more specifically during coronavirus uh, assisting affected uh, population in Niger. Welcome, sir, with us. Thank you very I have much. Also, uh, here with me, Mrs. Stella Bida from Belgium. Mrs. Stella Bida is an award winning entrepreneur. She's international speaker, business consultant, and strategist, and best selling author. Welcome with us. I have Mr. Abdou Diop from Morocco, and he is a managing partner of Mazar Audit and Conseil, which is an uh, international audit and consulting firm. He has just been appointed recently by the board of directors of the Confederation, president uh, of the brand New Africa Commission. Welcome, sir, with us. Soyez la bienvenue. Morning. Hi, everybody. Hi. I have also uh, our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Obiageli Ezek Wesili. Uh, Dr. Obi, welcome with us. And Dr. Obi is currently a senior economic advisor uh, of the Africa Economic Development Policy Initiative. She was co-founder of Transparency International. She served as Federal Minister of Solid Minerals and later Federal uh, Minister of Education during the second term of presidency. His Excellency uh, Mr. Olosegon Oba Sanjo. Uh, she was also Vice President of the World Bank Africa Division 
and also been involved in many international uh, raising awareness campaign, including the famous campaign, Bring Back Our Girls Home from Nigeria. And she has been nominated in 2018 for the Nobel uh, uh, Peace Prize for her work in transparency. Uh, welcome, uh, ma'am, with us. It's an honor to have you with us as a keynote speaker. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me start my first uh, question. I don't know if Dr. Obi is listening to us. Dr. Obi? Yes, I am listening to oh, you. Okay. I can hear you. Well, welcome, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Obi, I would like, to, to, I would like to, to start with you. Uh, of course, uh, 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 this time, Africa is witnessing uh, a lot of challenges and there are transformations that are currently happening, more specifically after this crisis. You have been holding uh, different positions, whether at government or at civil society. So you have both perspective. If you can give us a global perspective, what are the major transitions that the African continent uh, is undergoing today? What uh, have you documented as top priorities? Uh, and how are we ensuring uh, the inclusion of all different stakeholders to manage these transitions? You have the floor, ma'am. Um, just give me a minute. I'll try to see if my bandwidth can carry uh, the video. So um, I'm sure you're probably following developments in my country. So I am not, um, I'm just barely going to spend time with you because I, uh, one minute, let's see if I can survive a video the networks are not that great can you see me can you yes see yes ma'am we can we can see you all right uh, excellent well uh, first how, delighted uh, how are you yes delighted to be uh, very well thanks lovely to meet all of you very thank distinguished you, you, people Honored to have you i i yes um i will um i will dive quickly into um, the trust of the conversation. I, I love the fact that um, this conversation is to discuss uh, the path toward uh, more effective leadership on our continent and to uh, position our continent in the way that um, it can actually uh, be a, a, a continent no longer regarded as the laggard of all uh, continents. Uh, we have won that toga for too long and it is time that uh, that ended. And so I have always uh, said to the young Africans that um, Africa can claim the 21st century. Uh, it's in their hands. It's in the hands of the young. And it's in the hands of the women. These are the two uh, groups on the continent that have been marginal to uh, what has uh, been created by the uh, leaders of the continent since after uh, colonialism came to an end, mostly in the 60s uh, on, on our continent. And so I start off by sort of giving a context and, and, uh, and my context is that, you know, that for quite a number of uh, years, starting from about the mid uh, 2000, there was a turning of the corner uh, in terms of Africa's economic growth. Uh, and then that led to Africa being set to uh, be rising. And many of you had the, uh, the phrase Africa rising uh, during that period. Um, that period quickly uh, began to come to an end as uh, the global uh, financial coom economic crisis took hold from about the 2009s and, um, and growth went from the annual average of at least uh, four, four, four to five percent, uh, five and a half percent that it had recorded for about um, a decade and a, a, and a half thereabout, um, uh, the, the, the growth began to nosedive and ended at below 3%. And so it, the growth of the continent, the economic growth reversed because the global economic crisis affected Africa. And the global economic 
crisis, um, countries have not fully, the global economy hadn't fully recovered from it at all. And then the health pandemic sets in. And so here we are with the uh, challenge of an Africa that would need to recover many times over in order to even get itself back to where it was when the phrase Africa rising was becoming uh, 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 popular. So what does this mean for a continent? What it means for a continent is that it, things are going to be even more difficult, except if we did the extraordinary, which is why conversations like this are important. Why is it that things will become even more difficult? It, the reason is that even at the time we grew at an average of four to five percent annually every year for a decade, we did not tackle enough of the poverty with that Africa is defined with. So our growth was not leading to a rapid decline in the number of poor people, both in relative and as well as absolute terms. And so Africa at that time still had more than 50, uh, more than 40% of our citizens are living in extreme poverty. Before the health pandemic set in, my former institution would forecast that, uh, you know, the, the analysis showed that even by 2030, 2035, Africa would be the continent where 90% of extremely poor people will be located. So while the rest of the world would have forgotten about extreme poverty at that time, our continent would still have, would have the stock, the massive stock, and that two countries on our continent would be responsible for that. That Nigeria and DRC would have the largest population of poor people at a time that the whole world would have forgotten about extreme poverty. So this was the, 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 this was the uh, situation uh, before the health pandemic. Now imagine what this health pandemic and the economic impact of it is doing to the continent. What this then says to us is that the conditions that led to us not growing sufficiently to tackle poverty before the health pandemic must not remain the same condition after the health pandemic if we can get it behind us. In other words, if, we can, if the health pandemic can be put behind us and we all enter what is called the new normal, the way that Africa has been governed to produce this massive stock of poverty many decades after our independence should not be the story going into the rest of the 21st century, which is why gathering people like those you have around this table today to have a conversation on the matter of leadership is absolutely important. So I go on to say that there are five principal manifestations of Africa's failures that we must not repeat. And I say already I have talked about poverty, so I'm not going to uh, say anything more about it. The second thing that I talk about that, you know, is an indicator of our failure. The food insecurity and the impact that climate change would have and is already having on our continent, whether it is desertification of or massive floods and all kinds of erosions that we see on the continent, the not, not being in a place to uh, effectively respond to what climate change is doing to agriculture, production and productivity is an indication of failure of leadership that we cannot afford to take with us into the rest of the 21st century. You know, the one on agriculture is particularly burdensome because, you know, I went, it bothers one, not only burdensome, but it, it, it bothers one because the FAO 
estimates that more than 65% of the world's remaining arable land is in Africa. So that if Africa and Africa's leadership were, were well positioned, Africa could become the food belt for the rest of the world. But here we are suffering, suffering from food insecurity. We have the highest data in terms of stunted children because of malnutrition. That is totally unacceptable. Then I look at another issue, the third thing that shows failure, human development, human development score for Africa. We are the continent with the lowest human development score. Most of our countries are the, at the bottom of the HDI, which is a program of uh, the um, United Nations Development, uh, uh, of, uh, the UNDP program. Um, so you, you, you have uh, the, 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 the possible score being a one, and most of our countries average around a three and a half, or at most a four. That is so far from where we should be. And the reason that this is massive failure is that it is the definition of the failure of governments to deliver basic services of education, health, water, and sanitation services to the citizens. When citizens do not have these basic services, it is impossible for them to be transformed to economic agents. When citizens don't have these kinds of basic services, it is impossible for them to even take advantage of opportunities that are around them. When you have poor human development indicators, it is not difficult to see how that is possible. The African um, health systems are the most palace of health systems. The way that the divine has managed to protect Africa from coronavirus can only be the story of a miracle. And you know, we know that it's a perfect miracle because the forecast had been that we would be the continent where people would fall off on the streets and be dying in their dozens. Yes. But somehow, I think the God knowing that our, our, our health infrastructure was a mess, figured a way to protect the continent and its people from it. Yeah. So Don't. you can tell that education yeah. system and health system are in bad shape. I'm coming yeah. to an end. Yes. Um, yeah. The fourth, yeah. fourth yeah. indicator mm -hmm. is uh, the energy poverty. You look at energy poverty, there is no, uh, in, 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 and there is no uh, economy that grew without um, energy and critical infrastructure. And then of course, uh, the fifth, basis of uh, the failure is the low productivity across the continent. Yeah. Now, what are the solutions? The maybe maybe solutions. Doctor, doctor, doctor uh, Obi, maybe I can come back to you uh, later uh, because we're, we're going to have a session on uh, proposing alternatives and recommendations. So I'll come back to you. But, you know, you outlined uh, important uh, uh, guidelines for uh, actually our discussion by outlining uh, some of the uh, issues more specifically on the sectors where we failed and actually uh, that is a good transition to talk about new uh, new development uh, models as many uh, African countries today are uh, working towards uh, developing in an inclusive way uh, new development models ahead uh, for for the for the continent. Uh, basically, uh, there are models that we've been using before, but they have failed because they are not localized and uh, they have not uh, been, uh, uh, you know, responding to the basic needs uh, of the African people. And you mentioned something quite important is women and youth. And we know that the African continent constitutes more than 60% of, it, of its youth. And uh, uh, we, uh, they, there must be uh, inclusion 
inclusion of women and also uh, young people. And this crisis have shown that it increased more the uh, these disparities and also increased the gender gaps uh, 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 by not providing actually equal services to uh, women and youth. Uh, let me uh, let me start uh, by talking uh, to uh, Mrs. Grace and Japao. Uh, more specifically, she has a wide experience uh, 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 in also in government, but also in civil society. And I would like to uh, ask her uh, a question about the new business model. We have at the continental uh, level, of course, the uh, African Union Agenda 2063. We have many uh, development models uh, at different um, member states uh, of, of the AU. After this coronavirus, many countries started uh, ref uh, reflecting on how they're going to work on new business models ahead, uh, uh, 30, 30 years ahead, 40 years ahead. Uh, what do you think is not really working? Because we've been talking for these new business models for a long time, but the problem is at the practical level. From your own perspective, what are the new priorities and what needs to be changed at the implementation level as we have beautiful legislation and policies on paper but we're facing difficulty in implementing it in the ground mrs grace thank you so much i think uh, as the topic goes uh, leadership and major challenges for the development of africa uh, i take note of uh, many things that we have to, to talk about. Uh, when we talk of models, we need to start with the leadership. A le what, is, what is the meaning of a leader? What should a, a leader be? I think uh, to me, a leader is a motivator who motivates people around uh, those who surround her or him. A leader is someone who talks to Okay, his team. A leader is more of a listener than, you know, you don't listen to people. So when we come to issues like that, I think we have a problem here. We have also uh, something to do with the leadership. And um, yes, we have the coronavirus, which came uh, six months ago. But what are we doing for us to come out of this as Africa. We are depending on the Western world. We are not looking at our roots where we came from as Africa. So we are depending on what they are telling us. We are depending on their technology. We are depending on their science. Yet our grandparents as Africa, they were able to tackle some diseases without what the West, uh, Western uh, uh, countries are telling us today. Now, coming to what we should do, I think as Africa, um, I, I have been privileged also to sit in the uh, United Nations uh, Committee that we tackle issues of uh, uh, woman, uh, women and youth. I think the, the, the problem that we are having is with the uh, um, leadership in Africa is they are not looking at the woman and the youth. If we look at a woman and the youth, because let's say in my country right now, almost 80% are the youth. What are we doing for us as leaders to make sure that the youth are being sustainable? What is our role? Are we, are we being a role model as leaders? No. So I had to put some, uh, some notes concerning the question that I was sent to. I was saying leadership, it has, uh, um, it has about 10 faces. You know, you have to be, a, 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 a serving is a leader. Empathy, a create, a create, a creativity, a managing, team building, taking risks. But I'm just saying this because of your question. What we need to do because of the COVID-19 is one, we have to tell our leaders in our countries or in Africa to sensitize people on cleanliness and also on education to 
take care of them by doing what? By uh, providing to them the, is, is, is it, uh, uh, some support because we are, we are not supporting the youth. We are not supporting the women. And these are the vulnerable groups in Africa. And uh, I think it is not only Zambia, but I think all over Africa, we have this challenge. And how should we tackle it? We need to make sure that we, we put the face of a woman and a youth in front of every, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? Every arrangement that the government are talking about. What should we do? to sustain these groups? What should we do to come out of this slumber that the Western Africa has put on Africa? Um, I always uh, tell my friends to say, you know, Africa is very dynamic. Africa, it has got everything. Africa, it has got water. Africa has got minerals. Africa has got everything. And actually, when, let's say, uh, 20, 30 above, Africa can even sustain the whole world because God has given us a lot of things. Uh, but Mr. we Mr. are very because yeah. our, leadership, our leaders and ourselves, we are not focusing on the things that can help the, the youth and the woman. Yeah. Mrs. So Mrs. Mrs. Grace, you, 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 you outlined the importance of including both young people and women. Uh, of course, uh, there is a saying that says, uh, no policies is done for me without me. So how do you think we can inclusively include women and youth of the continent in the whole process of developing these new uh, models of development to ensure a better transition in the African continent? We need to include them in the uh, governance. The youth and the women, they have to be in the authority. Because right now, most people who are on author in authority are the outdated politicians or leaders. We are leaving the youth. We are, we are leaving the, the woman out there. And now, today, the youth are the most educated people who actually advance in thinking, advance in capacity. You know, it, it's, um, it's a group of intelligence young people, young, uh, young men and women, but we have left them aside. We want to click to oppositions that we cannot <laughs> function because our mindset is now outdated. We are leaving the youth. So the, 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 the most important that we have to do is we have to include the youth in the governance system. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Grace. I'll come back to you. I think it's uh, also a good transition to talk about this new leadership. We've been talking about we need new blood. We need new leadership. Yes. So we need to understand what are the characteristics of uh, this yes. uh, new leadership. And there's also a statement that uh, says that uh, in, you know, in the face of developing these models of development and also in the transition, even before coronavirus, uh, many countries have spent a lot of time building infrastructure, but they forgot to build the humans. So uh, to ensure yes. that we have a future a good transition for this African continent, we need to invest in the human capital. And that lead me to ask a question to Mrs. Stella Bida, mm -hmm. based on your vision uh, as an in, in entrepreneur and influencer, but also representative of an increasingly active diaspora. Uh, what, how can you describe for us this portrait of this new African leadership? And also I want to focus also on the term of entrepreneur because these times we're talking a lot about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in its large term is not just an entrepreneurship focusing on just business. You can be entrepreneur in civil society, in, poli uh, in, pol in politics, and also in business. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great opportunity to be able to share about this type of vision. I really see the new African leadership in two main dimensions. Key, the first one is saying that we will have in that vision leaders who lead very powerfully, yet from a space of openness and vulnerability. And what I mean by openness is that we have leaders who allow themselves to be deeply connected to the people that they lead, and with vulnerability, it means that we have leaders who dare to share their stories 
at a level where they say to people, look, the challenges you are going through now, I've been exactly through the same challenges. And by doing X, Y, and Z, this is what I've done to be where I am today. And these two values of openness and vulnerability are actually key to build trust. And trust is there as a key foundation so that everybody, all the stakeholders from the African continent look into one single direction. That's the first point. The second point is to say, well, you know what? Leadership is actually accessible to every single person. Not only mm. the people in the cities, but also the people in the villages. But unfortunately today, we can see that many people don't feel empowered to use their leadership abilities. Some people feel scared. Some people don't feel allowed to express it for diverse reasons that we can discuss. And this is where the leaders of today play a fundamental role. Because by sharing their stories, they will be able to help these people to get rid of their misbeliefs, misconceptions, and doubts around the leadership in Africa. And they will be able to express their own. That's really the second dimension. And everything that I'm sharing with you today, it's not taken from a book. It's really taken from practical experience from leading people, from seeing the people that I've led lead their communities and get at their turn results, phenomenal results in their own communities. And when they come back to me, they tell me, Stella, I never thought that I could be a leader. And I, I answered to them, well, I never thought that I could be a leader either. It is by listening to the stories of powerful leaders who dared to be vulnerable and open, who told me, Stella, sit down, and let me tell you the back office of actually being a leader and being successful. That's how today I'm able to inspire others. And what I mean by that is the new African leadership is a leadership of transmission. It's the transmission chain between the leaders of today and the people who are not even thinking about leadership, you know, and who don't know yet that they are the leaders of tomorrow. And the advantage of this approach is that we have people, we don't have people anymore who are standing there waiting for others to do something for them. Okay, do you Everyone mean, Mrs. Stella, Mrs. Stella do, you, do, you, do you mean that we need a new mindset and we need new mm. uh, approaches of empowering and coaching uh, new leaders, because as as we may notice uh, in the ground during uh, uh, the confinement, many uh, have started discovering their leadership uh, cap capabilities. So in your opinion, how are we going to unlock the potential of mm. these leaders? Because uh, every time we say more specifically on young people, they mm. are the leaders of tomorrow, but they're the mm. leaders of today. They will be the future decision makers. Yes. What, what are you... Uh, what can you tell us about this? I love, your, I love your question because it brings us to be very practical about things and not just talk about things. I'm going to be very practical. And being practical is really sending this invitation to the ones who are listening to this and who believe in this vision. I am doing today exactly what I talked about. It is I am having conversation with very powerful leaders in Africa from politics, business, international institutions, where they are opening up with vulnerability and sharing their own stories. We all know the power of stories already in our African cultures. And this is the way that I'm already seeing results of people saying, wow, he is at this level? I, didn't not, I did not believe that he would have gone through exactly the same challenges I, I see today. So, really sharing the stories, and this is my invitation to anybody who is a powerful leader within Africa, share your story, be open, vulnerable, yet very powerful, and reconnect that level of trust so that people can envision themselves as yeah. the leaders of tomorrow. So yeah. this is really a practical invitation. And this yeah. is something which is going on. <laughs> Thank you. That leads me to ask Thank a you. question to Mr. Abdou Diop, because uh, you've been witnessing 
many generations of business leaders who are actually implementing different uh, economic models uh, to promote growth in Africa, but also you've been seeing, you know, how they have uh, tried to survive this pandemic and that this uh, requires new thinking, new mindset, new business models. Do you think that the actual capacity that we have of a generation of uh, business leaders uh, is enough to manage the uh, transitions that we're hoping uh, for more specifically adapting to the new uh, priorities and needs uh, post coronavirus. Thank you very much Karima and thank you everybody for this invitation in this amazing uh, round table a very interesting and uh, amazing things I'm hearing since uh, uh, an hour and I uh, to answer your question, I agree with uh, Stella. I think that as business leaders, we need really to uh, show off and be considered as role model. And we need to uh, always present what is happening in Africa and what's happening in the right way, not the, 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 the Africa uh, that is presented in the news, but really the Africa we are building and the Africa we want. I think that there are many African business leaders which are truly African, totally African, and uh, trying to see how to uh, create value in Africa. And I think that today it's, it's our role for all of us that are born after the independence. We have a real role uh, to, to develop the continent. And the development of the continent will not be made by foreigners. It will be done by Africans, by African women, by African youth, and by African in, 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 in all the components of the, the, the continent. And we believe on that. And as a business leader, uh, we have a role to contribute to the social de and economic development of our countries, our region, and our continent. And for me, uh, we need really to continue to build our business model around five uh, priorities uh, and uh, five way of acting. The first one, is that uh, we need to try to focus on areas that are priorities for our countries. That means area that are uh, really in the development plan of each country where we are acting, because it's important. We, as business leader, we want to earn money, but it's better if we earn money in fields and areas that contribute uh, in the development of our countries. The second one, and uh, we have seen it with uh, this coronavirus crisis, uh, we need to have real uh, industrial and agricultural sovereignty in some countries, in some regions, and globally in the continent. It doesn't mean that every country must, be, uh, must have its industrial sovereignty. We cannot have industrial champions in every country, but at least in sub-regions, regions, and in the continent, we need to have our industrial and agricultural sovereignty. And as business leaders, we need to be part of that and have it in our mindset to be sure that we are acting in that. Uh, I mean, uh, instead of in investing in real estate in a country, uh, a business leader need more to invest in agriculture transformation or something that will have real impact on the community. The third one for me, is really to see how to uh, connect our economies to the global uh, world value chains and also to create value chain complementarity in our continent. That means that we need to talk between African countries. Uh, today, for, for instance, Morocco is working a lot in the car industry, but Morocco needs to talk to uh, Nigeria, to Ghana, to Cote d'Ivoire, to Guinea, which are good big producer of bauxite or uh, EVA, which are the main raw material for uh, aluminum, for, for, for car uh, industry, and also raw material, EVA is the raw material for tire industry. So we can build complementary value chain to connect to the global value chain and what I call made with Africa. Uh, because made in Africa is important, uh, all the action to have, industrial agriculture sovereignty, but we need also to build the made with Africa at the global value chain. That means that each component of the global uh, economies 
must have a part made with Africa. The fourth yeah, point. I think, I think I think Mrs. Job, what what you have said is quite uh, interesting. That lead me to uh, to Just, question one one thing important. Mm -hmm. Uh, that lead me to question one thing important. Of course, uh, at the African level, we have the African Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement, of course, that offers uh, different other opportunities. But yet, we don't have actually uh, any uh, important study on consumer behavior in Africa to actually know the perceptions of Africans on African products to promote what you just said, the development of local African products and also the value chains in order to promote intra-African uh, trades, uh, more specifically for small and medium enterprises? No, I, I think that uh, until before the coronavirus crisis, I agree with you, it was a real issue to promote the made in Africa because there is a consumption bias uh, in Africa because people uh, prefer, you know, uh, nowadays you have even the big designers worldwide which are working with African design. But uh, until before that, uh, our women and men were not ready to pay the price for African design, but they were ready to pay the price for everything that is designed by European. But today, as it's promoted even by big international designers, we are ready to do it. And I think that during the coronavirus crisis, uh, there, there have been a real awareness of the need to trade between African countries. When some African countries were in lack of some medicines, they were obliged to co connect to other African countries to have that medicine because Europe was closed, uh, Asia was closed. It was the same for the, uh, the food and all the agricultural goods. So I think there is a change of mindset that is beginning, but we need, if we want really to change that mindset, to have products that are made in Africa with African, uh, need, uh, which covers African needs, but with the international standards of quality. And that's where business community can be important. If, if you don't have, you don't propose products and local contact to people, they won't be used to uh, eat made in Africa or buy made in Africa. Yeah, so we you. have a responsibility as business community to really contribute to this change of mindset by investing in African uh, industries and promoting African thank, business. Thank, thank you so much. I'll get, get back to you as uh, we're going to have uh, uh, the other part of the talk uh, to uh, key recommendations. And I would like to, um, uh, to thank thank uh, uh, the participants with us here who are uh, sending questions but also interesting comments here on, on the chat and uh, I will be asking a few questions to design to certain speakers later. Let me uh, go to uh, my uh, last panelist for uh, for this talk, which is Minister Adal Roubaix. Uh, Monsieur uh, Adal Roubaix, you are, of course, Minister Conseiller of the President of the Republic of uh, Niger, and you are also President of the Movement Democratic for the Renouvelment, and you uh, are a doctor. So you have passed a very good moment with the communities, and especially when you have been during the coronavirus, so you have done a lot of action for the communities affected by the coronavirus. My question is, la suivante. Euh, euh, quel est, d'après vous et d'après votre expérience, le rôle euh, des hommes et aussi des femmes politiques pour même permettre à ce nouveau leadership dont on a parlé euh, tout à l'heure d'engager euh, euh, durablement les grandes transitions euh, que doit aborder ce, ce continent Je vous remercie. Hein, je vous remercie. J'ai écouté attentivement les interventions qui m'ont précédé. Et je dois dire que le plus difficile est fait. Euh, je constate qu'il y a une prise de conscience de, des Africains en général et de la femme africaine. Et cela signifie que nous sommes véritablement sur la bonne voie. Et, euh, je veux presque pratiquement répondre sur les précédentes dames qui ont, qui ont parlé. Je confirme que euh, la place de la femme et de la jeunesse africaine est extrêmement importante pour que ce siècle que nous pensons être le nôtre soit véritablement un, un, un siècle africain. Et pour répondre d'abord à, à votre question, euh, il est clair que euh, 
cette situation, cette pandémie, a révélé les faiblesses et les forces de l'Afrique. Les faiblesses, d'abord, pour rebondir sur ce que mon, mon ami et mon frère avaient dit plus tôt, nous avons constaté qu'il faut impérativement une autosuffisance alimentaire. Nous avons constaté euh, la montée en flèche de tous les besoins euh, alimentaires de l'Afrique, alors qu'en même temps, euh, comme l'a dit euh, une panéliste, nous avons les terres arabes les plus importantes de, de la planète. Nous pouvons être les greniers du monde et, et ça c'est très important à, à notifier. Et, euh, je vais encore revenir sur la nécessité du nouveau leadership africain. Je suis très optimiste parce que je constate que les différents panélistes ont touché du doigt tout ce qui m'est extrêmement important et je croyais être isolé. Et je me rends compte que de la Zambie jusqu'au Maroc, jusqu'à euh, là où tous ces intervenants viennent, nous avons la même conception. Nous avons le sentiment de l'urgence de faire de ce continent euh, la locomotive du monde. Et c'est tout à fait possible. Nous avons ce que d'autres n'ont pas. Nous avons la jeunesse, nous avons les ressources et manifestement aussi une formidable prise de conscience. Cette prise de conscience pour intervenir dans le domaine où je suis maintenant doit être politique également. Le leadership est d'abord économique, mais nous savons tous une volonté économique, une volonté euh, humanitaire qui n'est pas euh, liftée ou qui n'est pas aidée par la volonté politique est vouée à l'échec parce que les infrastructures ne, ne seront pas faites comme il se doit puisque c'est toujours et essentiellement politique. Nous sommes conscients du rôle géostratégique que va jouer le continent africain et il ne pourra pas le faire si de nouveaux leaders ne sont pas aux, aux commandes et des leaders qui sont conscients du potentiel de l'Afrique et qui, justement, pour parler du colonialisme, se sont débarrassés totalement de tout complexe, qui savent que c'est possible que l'Afrique soit ce continent vers lequel le peuple du monde va se diriger pour avoir du travail et n'ont pas constaté euh, le, le départ de nos cerveaux vers, vers les autres continents. Donc vraiment, euh, les tra grandes transitions africaines, elles seront certainement économiques, elles doivent également être euh, au niveau de l'éducation et qui dit éducation, dit jeunesse, dit éducation, dit formation. Et la femme à mon humble avis, et j'en ai la profonde conviction, sera la clé du développement de l'Afrique de demain. Et demain, c'est pratiquement aujourd'hui. Je voudrais, je voudrais poser une question, euh, euh, surtout pendant cette pandémie, on a, on a constaté le, le rôle important, bien sûr, des jeunes et des femmes, mais aussi euh, l'homme et la femme politique, euh, dans la gestion, non, non seulement dans la gestion, euh, ou la, la communication autour euh, de la situation de crise, mais aussi dans la prise de décision durant les états d'urgence, soit au niveau législatif ou politique. Euh, D'après vous, comment peut-on renforcer euh, le leadership politique, surtout des, des femmes et des jeunes Je pense d'abord que le leadership commence par un sentiment de responsabilité. La femme doit savoir qu'elle est responsable du destin de l'Afrique, tout comme la jeunesse africaine. Donc, euh, nous, notre rôle en tant que décideurs politiques, c'est justement cette concertation permanente, cette dialectique entre la jeunesse et ceux qui dirigent, pour que la jeunesse comprenne qu'en fait, rien ne se fera sans elle. Et euh, je reviens, je rebondis tout à l'heure sur quelque chose qui est très important en Afrique. Nous avons, euh, il faut se dire souvent la vérité, nous avons besoin de discipline, mm -hmm. euh, une ouverture d'esprit mais aussi une clarté dans les objectifs qu'il faut définir pour l'Afrique de demain. Le peuple et la jeunesse en général vont suivre lorsque les objectifs sont clairs et bien définis. Autrement, nous allons simplement parler et sans avancer. Je pense sincèrement que si nous montrons à la femme et au jeune homme africain, à la jeune femme africaine, qu'ils sont responsables dès maintenant, nous allons les voir s'activer, entreprendre, travailler, porter la voix de l'Afrique. 
Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Uh, well, I'll come back to some of the questions before opening uh, uh, the uh, debate. If you, one of the speakers, uh, have any comment on uh, on one of the other speakers on certain points, I'll, I'll, I'll get you, Mrs. Grace. I just want to uh, ask a complimentary question uh, with uh, to Dr. Obi. Uh, someone from the particip from the participants is uh, asking if you can elaborate a little bit more on the the uh, uh, poverty uh, issue that you've been talking to. Also, uh, the, the, the second part of uh, his question or her question is uh, uh, about the implementation or the, what, what is the uh, evaluation of the uh, European Union mechanism, the forest law enforcement government trade uh, plan that uh, uh, the European Union uh, 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 made on forest regulation. That was the question. Dr. Obi, are you here with us? Dr. Obi? Hello, yes. Hello. Um, I think on the poverty question, um, look, one thing that we know as a matter of empirical uh, data uh, that um, uh, tells us a lot about poverty is that when economies grow, they reduce poverty. But the mm -hmm. fact that economies are growing is not a sufficient condition for poverty to reduce. So we normally say that um, growth, economic growth, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for poverty reduction. So what it means is countries must grow in the right kind of way. And the best kind of way that we find countries to grow in order for poverty to reduce is for the economy to not just grow in an, a closed kind of way around natural resources. It is for the economy to grow by virtue of expanded opportunities to the citizens of the country. That's why investment in the people is the thing that African countries can do in order to achieve what we call broad-based growth, what we call inclusive growth. It is possible through the ideas that emerge from the people on what they can do in order to create value that they can exchange economically. And so that's on growth and poverty. Um, and, and for you to grow, there are three things that are necessary. You need um, strong institutions, uh, institutions that regulate the environment in a predictable way and which uh, give the signal as to where the incentives are and where the sanctions are in society. So your regulatory system must function well. For you to grow, you must have sound economic policies and uh, sectoral policies, policies that are sound. Don't go and do uh, silly policies just because you think they would work. No, research your policies well. Use evidence-based approach to get the right policies for your economy. We know, for example, that economies where the, uh, the government puts itself at the place of enabler, grows, they grow better as against economies where the government throws itself in the midst of all the sectors and pretends it knows what to do. No, they don't grow well. What it does is that it offers opportunity for corruption to the few people who are in government. Allow the private sector to drive the economy. We cannot have made in Africa by having governments that want to pretend to be the makers of Africa. The people of Africa, their business acumen, their capacity to generate combinations and collaborations and, and uh, a partner with the rest of the world would enable growth through a private sector. So that's, and so I've said now, uh, sound economic policies and sectoral policies, as well as structural policies. I've also said uh, strong institutions and regulatory systems. And the final thing is the right priorities of investment. You can't have your citizens not having maternal self, maternal um, mortality, maternal ish, uh, uh, health care or to, uh, infant health care, and you take the little budget to go and build a, a national <laughs> stadium or to go and build a castle for your president. That's a misallocation of uh, scarce resources. You have to choose your priority, right? Yeah. Invest in the public goods that your 
all need. Uh, and then the final thing uh, is uh, that, you know, on, on poverty reduction, we have seen that as technology became the greatest and the first revolution that Africa participated in, that technology is an important game changer for our continent. Yeah. If the African woman does not have any asset, has a smartphone, she has the best asset that can connect her to opportunities. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, uh, Dr. Obi, uh, sticking to recommendation, if you can give us uh, your top uh, two to three recommendations, what would you say? I would say that you need to, you, we need to fix politics on our continent. We must fix politics. Politics undermines everything. It is politics that undermines governance, undermines economy, undermines families, undermines communities, undermines the individual citizens. Our politics is awful because our political culture is awful. We have a political culture that allows political leaders to subordinate the interest of the common mm -hmm. to their own personal interests. Mm -hmm. We can't go far with that kind of political culture. So fix politics. And guess who will fix politics? It's not the politicians. They don't have an incentive to do so. In fact, they have a disincentive for doing so. So what we must do is to recognize that in the triangle of democracy, the citizens <laughs> are the ones that can fix politics. Because the triangle of democracy is citizens who are the electorate, politicians who are the political class, and the regulatory uh, uh, institutions that regulate the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Now, these two, the regulator and <laughs> the supply side, cannot fix politics. The Thanks. citizens must rise up and know that politics is defined as government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Oh, and yes. it is time so, to stop yeah. feeling disempowered. Yes. I think that I think, thank you so much. I think, uh, I think uh, lend uh, helpless. Lend helpless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, today in many constitutions where we were seeing that citizen normally should be the core of any policies, yet uh, we still have issues at the implementation level. Uh, thank you for this recommendation. I'll go to Mrs. Grace. I think first she had a comment and then I would I, uh, kindly ask her to give us her uh, key recommendations. Uh, I, I think what I wanted to say is that uh, first of all, I was Africans, we need to have to change our mindsets. Why am I saying so? Our mindset moves like a, a fly. We need to change how we think. We must, uh, we must uh, uh, have priorities. What are those priorities? One, How can in gain the, the very person whom they call a, 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 a from the compound or you know he has no education because the, that those are the the assets of the country which builds the economy from the low uh, income people if we can empower them th that is setting the priorities two we must look at the youth what is a youth supposed to do? What are, our, are we supposed to, to achieve in our economics if we don't have the youth? So we have to look at a woman, we have to look at the youth, we have to make sure that these two groups, we empower them. And um, I came to the mindset. I think in most of African countries, we don't, uh, uh, we don't support, we don't know our values. We don't know, we don't have that uh, mind of, you know, interacting as Africans. Because as Africans, if we start interacting, we will definitely achieve and our continent will be a continent that no one can suppress us. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that vision as Africans. Now, coming to um, the, recommendation, the recommendation, I think we, what we need to do as a Made in Africa, as one of my, my brothers, uh, one of the participants said, we need to change the business models. We need to be, to, to be interacting. We need to talk to each other. What does Nigeria do? What is the best 
that Zambia can learn from Nigeria? What is the best that uh, uh, Nigeria can learn from Cameroon? What is the best that uh, Cameroon can learn from Kenya? So we don't have that connection. We are disconnecting mm -hmm. ourselves because we say, I come from this country and I cannot connect with others. We need to change that because Africa can only uh, improve or Africa can only come up with a new strategies if we can work as one. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that is number two. Number three, I think uh, uh, we need to have industries. Most uh, economies collapsing because we are doing just buying and selling. We don't have industries. Industries that can employ a youth. Industries that can employ uh, a disabled person. Industries that can employ a woman. Industries, uh, because when we don't have indus industries, like Zambia, it's a landlocked or landlocked country. And if we don't have industries to empower our people, you find our economy goes down. Then yes. also we need to look at our constitutions because the constitution is a key to development. If the constitution is not well set, everything that we are talking here, whether economic or whether, whether uh, good governance, or what, it, it won't work because that is the basis of good governance. So we need to look at that. Now, coming to to things like, okay, let's say I'm wearing this uh, cloth. Let somebody from, uh, from Kenya say, that, cloth, that dress you are wearing is good. How can I get it? How can I buy it from you? So we, we, we need to have the leakages. We need to do the um, uh, networking. So as Africans, I think we need to network. We need to, yes. see the, uh, to set the priorities. And we need also to change our mindset towards each other as Africans. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're, we're still uh, talking now about fixing politics. And I would like to turn to Minister Adal. Uh, many of the recommendations said we need to fix politics. What's your take on? What is there, your recommendations? You are, no, uh, you are in the heart of politics. No, je suis d'accord. Je suis d'accord que la manière de faire la politique actuellement en Afrique n'est pas très sain et qu'il y a beaucoup de choses à arranger dans la conception de la politique elle-même, qui normalement est au service du peuple. Mais malheureusement, bien des dons politiques sont, ont fait en sorte que le pays soit au service de leurs propres intérêts. Euh, c'est une autre prise de conscience et je confirme que les hommes politiques ne changeront pas tant que le peuple, la population, la jeunesse et la femme ne les ont pas poussés vers le changement. Donc, euh, pour faire une ou deux recommandations, je dirais que euh, l'intégration africaine, parce que c'est quoi le problème? Il est impératif que nous ayons une seule voix en Afrique. Autrement, des géants comme la Chine vont se retrouver en train de discuter avec un petit pays comme le, le, le Burundi. Et vous savez bien qu'à la fin de la discussion, Burundi ne pourra pas avoir ce qu'il ce qu veut. Et, et donc, il est impératif d'accélérer cette union africaine qui doit être une union des peuples africains pour les intérêts de l'Afrique. Et ça prendra du temps, mais je pense que nous sommes, je suis assez optimiste, nous sommes sur la bonne voie parce qu'il y a une prise de conscience quasi générale en Afrique et on doit peut-être remercier la capacité de communication actuelle qui font que les opinions s'expriment. Et euh, donc, je reste optimiste et je pense qu'il faut accélérer cette intégration africaine du peuple. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Uh, now, transition from fixing politics to fixing business. Let me turn to, <laughs> let me turn to Mrs. Stella. What, what's your recommendation? more specifically focusing on uh, new business models that we need to take uh, into consideration uh, in this transition. Thank you. I know we talk a lot about the new, and since you bridged with business, one of the most fundamental aspects of business is looking back on what has been done. So I would really, I, I would go for one single recommendation is to 
take the time to leverage on the existing leadership stories that we know. Because we've already worked so much, but I have the feeling that every time we're always starting back over and over again. So why don't we look back and just look at the lessons learned and we will gain so much time. That's really my belief. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Diop? Thank you. I think I will go in the same path. It's important really to showcase stories and successful stories because they are African doers and African builders and our businessmen need to be African doers and African builders. We need to really contribute to building the Africa we want, as I say, and contribute to building the Africa we want means uh, made in Africa, uh, made with Africa when we talk to international community it's important uh, to to really industrialize our continent and also very important uh, made by africans because uh, we need to have uh, our youth be employed we need to have exclusive growth so mm -hmm. it's made in africa made with africa and made by africans Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think these are uh, really uh, wonderful uh, recommendations that could actually be more uh, developed more at a strategic and also at operational level to move on with uh, this uh, transition. And I think uh, taken from what you all said, it is very important to change the mindset. This is something very, very important. Maybe uh, we have uh, probably different time frames, uh, political yeah. for time frames and transitions time frame. T transition takes a lot of time. And of yeah. course, changing minds and behavior takes a lot of time. Yeah. And one yeah. of the lessons learned actually uh, at the operational level is that when we develop policies, we don't, uh, uh, we don't um, take enough time to accompany these policies with uh, mm -hmm. awareness raising campaigns so that people would know their rights and duties uh, in the process. And as Dr. Adal said, uh, politicians will not change if uh, citizens, including men and women and youth, will not push them to, to change. So it's a shared responsibility. And that also requires um, uh, um, a mindset. Uh, also, uh, we talked about the importance of investing in people. We invested enough in buildings. We need now to empower people and invest in people so that they can stay in Africa, build Africa with Africans for Africans. So mm. one of the, uh, 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 the failures that we consider is that we've been uh, taking examples of models from foreign countries implemented mm -hmm. it in the African continent without contextualizing it uh, to meet the priority needs of local people. So actually uh, international benchmarking is important, but uh, that requires uh, contextualizing those experiences to fit with the needs and priorities of local, uh, local people. Uh, you talked about also uh, the, uh, the portrait of who is the leader. Uh, of today, will not say the leader of tomorrow. And uh, there are two uh, important qualities, which is of course, openness and vulnerability. Today, we're working more to uh, lead people to be more resilient, more specifically in crisis time. And many uh, countries now are thinking ahead of how are we uh, including crisis management as an approach as a cross-cutting in policies and programs, and also in our way of doing business. We talked about also uh, uh, new approaches of uh, new uh, development models, but also uh, new business models and approaches as uh, the world today is knowing a rapid increase of digital transformation, though the African continent is still facing a lot of issues related to uh, gender gaps, uh, when it comes to digital disparities, connectivity, infrastructure, uh, and also in, uh, in uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, some of the panelists uh, refer to the reform of the education se sector, as there are many jobs that uh, will be displayed uh, in the future with artificial intelligence. Uh, there are many uh, new business opportunities that emerged with the crisis. So we need to think ahead, how can we uh, leverage those resources uh, in order to accompany 
more specifically small and medium enterprises to survive uh, these crises and also for young people to maintain uh, jobs or switch jobs categories according to uh, the new uh, emerging uh, markets. Of course, uh, to build new development models, you said that we need of uh, strong institutions that regulate the environment in a more productive way. We need sound economic uh, policies uh, uh, and structural uh, policies, and we need more integrated policies versus sectoral policies. Because if we take into consideration women and youth in particular, uh, which are the backbone of all policies, I think it is high important to include them in whole process uh, in governance. Without women and youth, we cannot envision uh, a future uh, development uh, model in the continent. And uh, lastly, uh, there was one important point. We need to change the narrative about the African continent and we need to be one voice. Uh, and as Dr. Adal said, we need to be the union of African people for the African people. This is something quite important because we have the capacity, we have the talents, uh, we have we have already, as uh, Mrs. Stella uh, Bida said, we 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 already uh, have existing models. We need to capitalize on these models. We need to uh, to evaluate the existing and in the in the uh, perspective or continuity. Uh, not create new things out of scratch, but build on, on what we have, learn from what uh, what worked, and improve what is not working. Thank you so much uh, for your insightful talk. This is uh, just the beginning, and I would like to remind you that uh, we are having our next edition on Thursday, October 29th on the challenges of African cooperation and I hope that you will be uh, joining us for the upcoming talks. Thank you so much. I, you. I apologize for uh, the participants who are asking a lot of questions in the chat. Maybe we will be following up with you because of time. Uh, we cannot, uh, um, you know, have uh, more uh, questions uh, at this time, but we will be keeping in touch and thank you so much uh, for uh, participating with us. Thank you, Made in Africa, for this wonderful idea of bringing together different stakeholders from government, civil society and businesses to open these talks, these much needed talks, actually, which uh, constitute a foundation of what you just said. We need to connect, we need to talk, we need to exchange, we need to learn from each other, and we need to find that way to cooperate with one another. Thank you so much, Karima Ghanem. I'm president of the International Center for Diplomacy. I was very happy to moderate this session. Thank you. Thank you, Karima. Thank you, thank thank you, you so you much, Karima. Thank, thank you, Karima. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.